This is to cover the topic of inventory measurement, chapter 18. Chapter 8, sorry. Recording and measuring inventory. There, there are different types of inventory. There's merchandise inventory, which is goods acquired for resale. And then there's manufacturing inventory, which includes raw materials, work in progress, work in process, and finished goods. So this is if we're making it, and this is if we bought something and then we're reselling it. So if we're talking about manufacturing inventory, the raw materials are purchased, and then you have direct labor incurred, and then there's also manufacturing overhead. All of these would be combined, and then they would be sent into work in process. This is when we're combining the goods to transfer to the finished goods. And then when we finish work in process, it transfers to finished goods, and then eight transfers from finished goods into cost of goods sold, where you'll sell the transaction. So there are two types of accounting systems used to record transactions involving inventory. A perpetual inventory system, which is the inventory is accounted, an inventory account is continuously updated as purchases and sales are made. Or periodic, which is, happens once in a while, right? The inventory is accounted and adjusted for at the end of the reporting period. Let's go through the perpetual, constantly updated. So, Lothbridge Wholesale Beverage Company begins 2013 with 120,000 in inventory. During the period, it purchases on account of 600,000 of merchandise for resale to its customers. So, if this was a perpetual inventory system, we would debit inventory and credit account payable. This returns on the inventory are credited to inventory and discounts can be reported using the gross or net method. Now, during the year, um, they sold on account inventory with a retailer at a price of 820000 and a cost basis of 540 to customers. So we recorded the inventory, which was inventory, debit, credit, accounts payable. Now we're going to credit um, sales revenue and we're going to debit accounts receivable for our selling price, the retail price. But we're also going to make an adjustment. We're going to talk about the cost in the same transaction. So we debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory for the exact same amount as the cost of goods sold. So the periodic inventory system is not designed to track either the quantity or cost of merchandise. Cost of goods sold is calculated using a schedule below after a physical inventory account. So that was perpetual and we constantly make journal entries so it should always be correct. Then beginning for a periodic, we calculate cost of goods sold by using this formula. Beginning inventory plus net purchases equals cost of goods available for sale. Subtract ending inventory, and that is our cost of goods sold. Let's start with the same information. We have Lothra's beverage, which begins with 120000 in inventory and purchases 600000 on account. So instead of, we're not going directly to the inventory account, we're going to a purchase account. Purchases 600,000, accounts payable 600,000. Now during the year, they sold inventory to a retailer with a price of 820,000 to customers and a cost basis of 540. Accounts receivable 820, sales revenue 820. No entry is made to cost of goods sold. A physical count of ending inventory shows a balance of 180,000. So let's calculate cost of goods sold. We only make this adjustment at the end of the year. So beginning inventory plus the purchases equals 720,000 cost of goods available for sale. Subtract out the 180 remaining and we get a cost of goods sold of 540. We need to make the following adjustment. On December 31st, we debit cost of goods sold. We also debit inventory, which is our ending. We credit inventory the beginning and we credit purchases to 600000 Here's a comparison chart of the inventory systems. If the transaction or event is a routine purchase, costs are debited to a purchase account using periodic or debited to inventory using the perpetual. And when we sell inventory, no adjustment entries are made to inventory in a periodic. In a perpetual, which is the constantly updated, the debit cost of goods sold, and credit inventory. At the end, for periodic, we need to take a physical inventory account and adjust cost of goods sold. 
at the end of a perpetual which is constantly updated, there is no determination of cost of goods sold necessary. We've been keeping track the whole time. What's included in inventory? The problem, in some situations, the identification of items that should be included in inventory can be difficult. Consider the following. Goods in transit. Is it our inventory or is it the person who sold it to us? And it depends on freight on board shipping terms. And then consignment goods. These are goods we're holding for someone else and we're only collecting a commission, so it shouldn't really be part of our inventory. What, is, what expenditures are included in the cost of inventory? So in the cost of inventory, we include the invoice price. We also include freight in on purchases, so the cost to ship it to us. We subtract returns and allowances and purchase discounts. Purchase returns. So here's what a transaction would look like with a purchase return. On November 8, 2013, the, the company that we've been working with, LWBC, returns merchandise that had a cost to LWBC of $2,000. So, if we're using the periodic, which means we adjust at the end, we debit accounts payable, because we're not going to have to pay this, and credit purchase returns. If we're using a perpetual, we debit accounts payable and credit inventory. And then here's how you would take care of purchase discounts. If you're using the gross method, it would be purchases $20,000, accounts payable $20,000. And then accounts payable $14,000 because we got a 2% discount here. And then purchase discounts $280, cash $13,720. And then we're paying the remainder, accounts payable and cash. If we use the net method, which is the $20,000 times the 2%, so purchases is recorded net of the discount, so purchases, accounts payable, and then it's accounts payable and cash, and then interest expense because we didn't pay the whole amount, so we only got a portion of this amount, the $400 that we could have gotten. Now we're going to talk about inventory cost low assumptions. We're going to cover specific identification, average cost, FIFO, also known as first in, first out, and then LIFO, also known as last in, first out. Perpetual average cost. Picture this. LLC is in the process of determining the cost of goods sold for a frame number 759 for the month of September. The physical inventory count on September 30th shows 2,000 frames in ending inventory. The perpetual average cost method is used to determine ending inventory cost and cost of goods sold. So here, so this is the inventory for frame number 759. At the beginning of the month, they had 2,000 units on hand, and the cost per unit was $10, for a total cost of $20,000. They made purchases on 9-3 of 1,000 units at a cost of $10.75 for a total cost of $10,750. And on 9-21, they purchased another 1,000 units at $10.95 for a total of $10,950. They, the, they had units available for sale of 4,000, and they have 41,700 as the total cost. Here's a count for the units sold in September. On the 7th, they sold 500. On the 29th, they sold 1,500. For a total of 2,000 units sold in September, they had 4,000 available for sale, subtract what they sold, and they have an ending inventory of 2,000 units. So then we have to account for the inventory on frame number 759. At the beginning, they had 2,000 units for $10 a unit, so 20,000, and then they purchased on 9-3 another 1,000 units for $10.75. So total cost is Thirty thousand seven fifty divided by the three thousand units. So what they're doing is doing a perpetual average cost. So every time they purchase, they then change the average cost. So the average cost based on three thousand units when they sold the nine on nine seven was ten dollars and twenty five cents. So that's the number you're going to use for the units sold. So you do five hundred times 1025, or they sold $5,125 worth of units. Now, you have inventory that's being purchased. You have inventory on hand. So we had 3,000 units. We sold 500, so we have a remaining 2,500 units 
at $10.25. So here's what's sitting in the perpetual average cost. Then you purchased 1,000 units for $10.95. So at this point, you have 3,500 units for sale, and you add these two numbers together, and that gives you a new average perpetual cost of $10.45. So we're going to sell 1,500 units at $10.45. So our total cost of the units we sold, or cost of goods sold, is 10,800. We have an ending inventory of 2,000, and this is our average cost at this point. So we multiply that out, and these two numbers should get to our total cost. Now let's say we can use another one, which is the weighted average periodic system. Let's say we use the same information to assign cost to ending inventory and cost of goods sold using a periodic instead of a perpetual inventory system. Remember, perpetual is constantly updating. Periodic, we adjust at the end. So you have beginning, beginning inventory plus purchases equals available for sale units, which is 4,000, minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. So you have 41,700 divided by 4,000 units equals an a, a weighted average of four ten dollars and 42.5 or 43 if we're rounding cents per unit. They use the whole scenario. So here's a weighted periodic system. So you have beginning inventory plus purchases plus purchases equals available for sale. And then you have 500 units plus 1500 units equals units sold. And now you're using the average weight, weighted average cost, which is $10.42.5. So 20850 is your cost that gets sold and ending inventory is the same because you have 2000 units on both at the average weighted cost. Now, FIFO, first in, first out method, assumes that the items that came in in a chronological order of their acquisition, so whatever we took in first is what we sold first, first in, first out. The cost of the oldest inventory items are charged to cost of goods sold when goods are sold. The cost of the newest inventory items remain in inventory. Even though periodic and the perpetual approaches differ in the timing adjustments to inventory, the cost of goods sold and ending inventory costs are the same under both approaches. So here's an example of FIFO, first in, first out. So now we have 2,000 units at $10, we have 1,000 units at $10.75, and 1,000 units at $10.95. We have a cost of goods sold of 2,000 units. They're coming from the beginning inventory, FIFO, so we're going to use this $10 for the cost of goods sold and we're going to use the other. So cost of goods sold equals 20,000, right? And then 1075 for 1,000 units, which is this, plus this equals our 21,700. So inventory is sitting with a higher number and cost of goods sold is sitting with a lower number because the cost per unit was rising at that time. And we take FIFO, first in, first out. The opposite of FIFO is LIFO last in, first out. We assume the newest items are sold first, leaving the older items in inventory. This means that the newest items are part of cost of goods sold, whereas the oldest are part of inventory. Unlike FIFO, using LIFO method resu may result in cost of goods sold and ending inventory that differ under a periodic and perpetual inventory system. LIFO is the same. FIFO, the ending, might differ if we're using a periodic adjustment or a perpetual inventory system. So, so the oldest units are those that are more likely to remain in inventory when using LIFO. The cost of goods sold on September 7th sale came from purchases of September 3rd. So we record the cost of goods sold right here, 1,000 units. We sold 500 of them, and the cost was 1075 because that was the newest when we sold on 97. We didn't have these $10.95 items. We sold 500 units at 1075 for 5375 And then the cost of goods sold on September 29th comes from the September 3rd purchase, the remaining 500 units, and then 1,500 units from September 21st for a total. So 1,000 units from 1095 and then the remaining 500 units, because we only purchased 1,000 is the newest. So we have to take 1,000 from the newest and then 500 from the remaining amount of this. And so we get 1,500 for a total cost of 16,325.
So here's how it looks. We have 500 units sold at, this is the last in first out inventory system. Now if we're going to take it on a periodic inventory system, then the cost of goods sold would be 21700 and ending inventory would be marked at $10, which is the 2,000 units, the oldest for 20,000 in a periodic system. So it doesn't match. So when prices are rising, FIFO, matching older costs with current higher sales, inventory is valued at approximate replacement cost. FIFO will result in a higher pre-tax income when prices are rising. And LIFO matches newer costs with current higher sales, and inventory is valued on a lower, older cost basis, resulting in a lower pre-tax income. LIFO is an important issue for U.S. multinational companies. Unless U.S. Congress repeals the LIFO conformity rule, an inability to use LIFO under IFRS will impose serious impedient to convergence. So, LIFO is permitted and in U.S. GAAP, but it is not permitted in international standards. And therefore, they would only use LIFO, a multinational company would only use LIFO for domestic inventory. So, from a decision-making perspective, why would I choose one over another? So, factors that influence my decision. How closely do reported costs reflect actual flow of inventory? How are income taxes affected by the different inventory method? And how well are costs matched against related revenue? Many companies use LIFO for external reporting and income tax purposes, but maintain internal records at FIFO. The convergence from FIFO or average cost to LIFO takes place at the end of the period. I'm not going to cover LIFO liquidation. Inventory management. So remember we did some ratios earlier. The gross profit ratio is gross profit divided by net sales. The higher the ratio, the higher the markup a company is able to achieve. Inventory ratio is designed to evaluate the company's effective in management, managing its inventory. Its beginning inventory plus ending inventory divided by two gives you average inventory. And then you take cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. Changes in ratios we discussed above often provide information about the quality of the company's current period earnings. For example, slow turnover ratio combined with higher than normal inventory levels indicates the potential decrease production, obsolete inventory, or a need to decrease prices to sell inventory, which will result in a decrease in gross profit ratios and net income. Many believe that manipulating income reduces earnings qualities because it can mask permanent, earning, uh, mask permanent earnings. Inventory write-downs and charges in inventory methods, changes in inventory methods are two additional inventory-related techniques a company can use to manipulate earnings. Methods of simplifying LIFO. I'm not going to talk about LIFO pooling. And we'll come back to dollar value LIFO. So this is where we're going to actually end. We'll, we'll stop here. And then we'll do examples in class.